is going to be another uh, picnic. Um, it's also going to be a day that we are choosing to um, have a baptism that day. So if you or anybody that you know is wanting to commit their life to Jesus, um, that's a day that they can make the public proclamation. Um, and uh, we did it one time uh, last year. We did it in the city park, and we had people who just came in off the street to be baptized, and it was just wonderful. So, But that will also be a day of a picnic, only this time we're going to be providing the meal for you, just like today. Today after service is the picnic. We're just going to gather together and just fellowship a little bit, and um, Pastor Zach is all geared up. I know you're not cooking, so I don't know why you're wearing that, just because I don't know why. I'm cooking the meat. Oh, you're cooking. All right. You know how much I like to cook. Yeah. Okay. Meat. <laughs> okay. So please stay after service and just have a little fellowship and a little fun with us. Is there going to be lots of meat? Um, there's a lot. Yeah. There's beef and turkey and hot dogs and any, sausage and veggies. Meat, meat, meatless meat? Yes, there is meatless oh, good, meat. Oh, good. So for the two people who like meatless meat, um, we will serve you. <laughs> we will serve you gladly. Gladly. Um, and the last thing then is just the connection card that's in your seat. Um, if you would just want to take time and fill that out. We just want to know you a little bit more. It's not that we use that for anything other than that. Um, we just want to get you connected. We want to get you connected to Facebook. And we do have an Instagram account. We want you connected to the Rivers page so that you can know what's happening here. Um, because we're picking things up. Things are just um, moving forward. And there's more things that are going to be happening here all the time. So with that... He took his thing off. <laughs> it's you. I don't cook meat. I'm one of those meatless people. Good morning, church. I'm going to move this over here. Vegetarian style. It's, it's like meat, but without it. <laughs> Some days. So we're jumping right in this morning. In the chapter of his book called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, called Choose to Trust, Mark Rograp, he references this hymn that was written in the late 18th century by the English poet William Cooper. These are the words that we'll begin this morning with. This is the, a hymn titled, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm, deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not by the Lord, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides his smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his interpreter, and he will make it plain. Do you hear how the how Cooper juxtaposes the realities of the storms of life, the hardships that we face, the versus the goodness of God's character? He says, "How dreadful clouds can pour down blessings." How a, a frowning providence can reveal God's smiling face. In this series, yet through the storm as followers of Jesus, we have juxtaposed the reality that we live in. That the world is broken and God is good. There is pain and hurt and disappointment and God is just and sovereign. These are hard realities to reconcile. Yet, as people of faith, we have been given a language, a prayer, a path that leads us from a place of dealing with the storms of life toward trusting more and more in who God is. A language that stands in the gap between pain and promise. And this language we have titled, slash the, the psalmist titled, Laments. Laments are prayers and pain that lead us to trust. Laments allow us to get real about and open up our raw emotions, our raw feelings of pain and hurt and sorrow, and they give us a way to speak to God so that we can be led to, from a place of despair and dealing with the storms of life to a place of trusting in the goodness of God more and more, even as the storms rage in our life. The language of lament helps us to pray words 
that we can pray in pain that lead us to trust. For the better part of a month, we've been unpacking how we might be able to implement this language in our lives. We've been paying special attention to the patterns that exist in lamenting psalms. In the close to 60 lamenting psalms, we find that there is a similar four-part pattern that exists that I believe helps us understand how we talk to God. How do we deal with the storms of life? How can we go to God when we're hurting so much and we don't really want to face God? How do we do that? So there's a four-part process in these psalms that we've been kind of unpacking. The first we we talked about was, was the simple idea of turning to God where we hear the psalmist, they, they cry out in attempts to anchor themselves to God in some way. The second step is complaining. The, the psalmist lays out the hurts and sorrows and, and pain that they might be experiencing. And these f- come in the forms of questions, right? The why questions and the how questions. The third step that we, f- we focused on last week is the, the writers, the, the psalmist, boldly asking God to work on their behalf. And in this part of the process, we see the, the psalmist change the question from why and how to who, confidently calling upon God to act in his accordance with his character, which leads us to the fourth and final part of the lamenting process, trust. Typically, each lamenting, lamenting psalm leads us to a renewed trust in what God has done and what God will do. And we all want to get there, right? Especially as we deal with life in the middle of the storm. We all want to get to that that trusting process where we can say without a shadow of a doubt, Lord, I I trust in your will. I trust in your ways no matter what is happening. We all want to get there. But when the storms of life are crashing in on the boat, when we're getting pounded by the hardships of life that we face, trust in God is hard to do. Especially because we like control. And in the middle of the storms, when it seems like nothing is happening, when it doesn't seem like Jesus' hand is waving to fix it, we we can use our prayer and our cries to try to control God's will. Our prayers in these moments can be a way for us to try to force God's hand instead of trusting in God's hand. And the nice part about the first three steps of the lamenting process is that we have control of some part of that process. Think about it. The first step, turn. Turn has us saying to God, okay, God, I'm in the middle of this storm and I'm, I am going to anchor myself to you. I am going to turn to you. The second step, complain. Okay, God, I want you to listen to me as I lay out my heart for you. I want you to hear all the things I'm struggling with, all the questions that I have. I want you to hear it. And the third step, ask, okay, God, I know those, those hows and whys turn into focusing on who you are but I'm asking you to work on my behalf in a big way, in a bold way. Now in these three steps, whether we'd like to admit it or not, we have the ability in some capacity, if we think about it, to impose our will on God. We try to bend God's will to our will. We try to get God to obey our words. We say, God, hey, heal my illness Soften my loved one's heart. God, would you make a new job happen? God, can you just push the right button so we don't have to deal with infertility anymore? We say, God, can you just make it to go take us back to a time where we don't have all these troubles, all these, all these pains, all these hurts that we're dealing with? Can you just take us back to a time where we didn't have to deal with the realities that we face with the brokenness in this world? And if you remember the very first week, I just want to go back to a time where I was just catching lightning bugs in a jar. Because that was the best time. Because I didn't have any of the the real realities of the brokenness of the world to deal with. Now if we're not careful, all these feelings come through in the first three steps of lament. And it's easy to lose sight of the glue that holds the lamenting process together. Which comes in the form of trust. Trust in, in the fact of who is really in control. And whether we like it or not, lamenting process has nothing to do with our control. It has everything to do with God's control. We can say the right things. We can push the right combination of buttons. We say to God, okay, God, here I am. I'm anchoring myself to you. I'm turning to you. But really in doing so, some of us are actually saying, is this what you want me to do, God? Is is this finally going to be the thing that that helps me get out of this storm? If if I just say, Lord, I'm turning to you. I'm anchoring myself to you. Is that it? We do everything we can to say, okay, God, 
All right, if you want me to complain, I'm a good complainer. Here I go. Why is this happening to me? How long is this going to happen to me? Do you want me to get real about who I am, God? Okay. Do you need me to acknowledge the fact that you are God, that my whys and my hows are not compared to who you are? If that gets me out of the storm, I'll do it. We do everything that we can, everything, in those first three steps, to try to make God show himself, don't we? That, that's the reality. We try to hit the right buttons. It's like, okay, that combination didn't work. Let me try this one. Boop, 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 boop. No, no, God, let's try another one. That's what we do. But in this step of lament, the final step, all of that goes out the window. Church, this is the reality of the world we live in. The world is broken and God is good. And there's nothing that you can do or say or not do or not say to bend the will of God to your will. That is difficult for us to really (laughs) acknowledge because we are control freaks. There's nothing that we can do. Nothing. And in the first three steps of lament, that kind of like comes against that, right? Because it's like, okay, I turn to you. I complain to you. I ask you boldly. I do all that stuff. That sounds a lot of, of me. But there's nothing that we can do. And we can hear that in a way of like, well, that is a bummer. Or we can think about it in the way that Paul talks about. There's nothing that you can do that will ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Anytime we feel the presence of God, it's not because of anything that we do. God's grace is not something that we earn. It's not something that can go away. It's there in the good. It's there in the bad. It's it's in the sunniest days. It's in the stormiest days. Aubrey Sampson, in her book, A Louder Song, brilliantly states this, God's grace greets and transform us, transforms us, whether or not we deserve it. And it's believing in that and choosing to trust even when it feels like we have no reason to that we take a powerful step toward our lament. I have to be honest with you. You've all heard my heart in this series. And in my preparation, in, in dealing with infertility in our lives, I have thought in this series, and I kid you not, okay, Lord, I'm stepping in front of the church. Is that what you want me to do? Are the, is that the right combinations of buttons to push so that I finally get what I want? I have legitimately thought that. I, I kid you not. Like, that is my heart open to you, saying, oh. And as I, re, as I realize this, as I work through this, I go, man, Lord, I'm sorry. Because there I am again, trying to take control of this process. I don't know if any of you do this, but it feels like I'm trying to unlock the secret code to get to the secret level. Maybe you do it, maybe you don't. But unfortunately for me and for many of us, as we wrestle with this concept of lament, the more we find out, the more we study, the more we read, we find that lament isn't about us. It's not about what we do or what we can say or not say or not do. The glue that holds our prayers of lament together is trust. Trusting that God's grace is always there, that there's nothing that I do, there's no buttons I push to unlock more of God's grace. While I might not understand how or why, I don't understand the fullness of God's grace in all of it. What I find in, the, in lament is that trust is the glue that holds the whole thing together. Trust is the ability to proclaim the word yet that we talked about last week. Yet in the middle of the storm, Last week, we touched on this word yet, and we briefly explained the word yet is this eclipse moment, if you recall, that that the why and the how, they're they're eclipsed by the who, and and in an eclipse moment, all you see is is the thing in front of the other thing, right? So if the sun's here and the moon's here, all you see is kind of the moon, but the sun is shining. It doesn't mean the sun's not existing. It doesn't mean it's not there. It just means for that moment, it's blocked out. The word yet is, is used time after time after time throughout the Psalms to proclaim that while there is suffering and pain, God's God's ability to to overcome that stands in its its wake. The word yet is is prominent through the lamenting Psalms. And it's this game-changing word that shows up in the Psalms and in the book of Lamentation. 
That's written by the prophet Jeremiah. Lamentations actually is the first thing that a lot of people think of when we talk about lament, when we're like, okay, we're going to do this series on lament. And people are like, oh, great, lamentation. And lamentation is not a fun book to go through. Let me just tell you that if you haven't gone through it yourself, because it's a book of poetry. And if you're not a poetry fr- like fiend, like I despise poetry. When I was going through my Old Testament survey, here's a side note, Old Testament survey class, I was like, keep me away from all the poetry in the Old Testament. I don't like it. Anyways, but the book of Lamentations is this, this structured poetry that paints a picture of the rise and the fall of Jerusalem. It's a book that speaks about the people of God and the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and, and the hopelessness that they begin to feel. And the prophet Jeremiah, in the middle of this destruction, is, is, is prophesying into this, this, this just d- desolation. And in the middle of his book, in the middle of the, the poetry of Lamentation, in chapter 3, he proclaims the word yet. All of this stuff is terrible. How could it happen? How could it happen? Chapter 3, verse 21 says this. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Now the structure of lamentation, you, you see just, it's sad. It's, it's, it's the, the, the prophet just, just speaking words of, of despair and hopelessness. And Jeremiah, right in the middle, he says, yet. It's like smack dab in the middle of the book. In the middle of this, the pain and the sadness and the sorrow, Jeremiah's yet is found in his belief and in trust in the unchanging, steadfast love of God. Through his yet, Jeremiah declares, even if the suffering will never end, I will always worship you. You see, this word yet, while it's hard to declare, it shifts our lament toward trust. For us, the yet is this important moment as we cry out, as we, as we complain to God, as we ask boldly. The yet turns us to say, that stuff is going to be tough, yet you are good. Samson says this, speaking to the word yet. She says, yet arises even when cancer isn't, the cancer isn't cured. When the debt never decreases, when the boyfriend doesn't call, when the child continues to struggle, when the questions aren't answered, when the loved ones hurt you again, yet believes that even if it doesn't go well with you, Jesus' love is still enough. His compassionate love is more than enough. Friends, this is important to understand. In this whole series, if you came and you're thinking like, okay, all I got to do is this, 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 and this, and then I'm going to be fine. The unfortunate part about that is lament doesn't lead us to results. Lament doesn't lead us to clarity. Lament doesn't give us answers. Lament leads us to God and God alone. No matter what happens, no matter what doesn't happen, no matter how violently the storms rage, no matter how many storms rage, lament leads us to our yet This storm, Lord, is overwhelming and debilitating, yet I will trust in you to lead me through it all. This world is broken, yet God is good. Yet marks the place in the storms of our life where pain and belief coexist. These two realities are wrestled with in the middle of the storm through our prayers of lament. Believe me when I say this is hard to come to terms with, that our lament doesn't lead us to resolution. Because I'll tell you, that's all I want. In my life, in the storms of my life, all I want is resolution. All I want is an answer. All I want is conclusion. It's hard to understand that the goal of lament isn't to make the pain go away. But, or yet, if we can come to realize that there's nothing that we can do to experience more of God's grace, and if we can come to trust that God is good even when the world is broken, if we can find that place where belief and pain can coexist, my question is, could the storms of our life not lead us 
to getting stronger ourselves, but would, would they lead us into the presence of an almighty God even deeper than what we already know? Here again, Samson's words. This is our firm foundation in disequilibrium, a God so intimately intertwined with suffering that he transforms the very nature of suffering itself. Jesus gives us a new way to suffer. Christians can suffer with yet attitudes. Friends, laments are not easy. They're not a language that comes as a second nature to us, especially because we don't like dealing with suffering. But Jesus, as, as Samson notes, came to take on suffering and lament so that we might be able to know the great depth of God's love and grace poured out for us. Because on the cross, Jesus took upon the weight of sin and shame of the world. He took upon the storms of this life. He took that on and he died so that we might be able to experience life with the hope of yet. The world is broken, yet Jesus became fully human and took on despair and pain that exists in the world so that we might have access to grace and love that God has for us. Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected three days later so that we might be able to declare yet in our own lives. The storms are raging, yet God is my shelter. The walls are caving in, yet God is my stronghold. I feel lost, yet the Lord is my shepherd. I'm feeling hopeless, I'm hurting, and I'm filled with sorrow, yet Jesus took on hurt. He took on sorrow. He is the God who took on the world so that we would be able to find hope, that we would be able to declare yet in our lives. Our laments, they're meant to lead us to no other conclusion than this. God's love and mercy and grace is sufficient. And that in, and that in itself is the anchor in our lives. That isn't always easy to understand or experience, but as people of faith, that is the reality that we hold up. Our faith in the mighty name of Jesus leads and guides us through the storms of life, even when there is no conclusion in sight. It's by the grace and love of Jesus. It's the presence of God in our lives that opens our eyes to who God is and what God wants to do, even in the middle of storms. A few weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast, and they were speaking to trusting in God's provision, and they highlighted this well-known miracle in the book of Mark, and it directed my eyes to a different part of this well-known story, directed my heart to a a different part of this well-known miracle. Chapter 8 of Mark's gospel, starting in verse 22, they came to Bethesda, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. For many of us, this story, we want to jump to, well, what does Jesus do to open this man's eyes. And in the middle of the storms of life, this story feels good because Jesus opens the man's eyes. He, he heals him. And we, we like to think like that immediately creates clarity for us. And I would love to say that that's the point of the story, but that is not where my, my heart was directed. I want to draw your attention to the beginning of that, that passage again. Verse 22. They came to Bethesda and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him and then read this. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He took him by the hand and took him somewhere else. He didn't know where he was going. He was blind. Only there does he perform the miracle to heal this man's blindness. Church, in the middle of the storms of our life, it feels like we cannot see anything in front of us. It can be scary and unnerving, and yet, this is the promise that Jesus gives us in this story. Outcomes aside, in our inability to see, Jesus reaches out and offers a hand to guide us in our blindness in the storms. 
So I ask you, what then will it take for you to trust Jesus to take you to a place where he has the ability to open your eyes and create more clarity? What will it take to just trust Jesus in the midst of the storms without knowing where you're going, without knowing how long it's going to take you to get there? When we cannot see, when the storms are just so difficult to see what's coming up ahead, when you don't know which way to go or how to navigate the storms in your life, this story teaches me and it tells me that Jesus is holding his hand out and saying, let me be your eyes. Trust my eyes, trust my way, trust my heart for you as you face the blindness, as you face the storms in your life. Friends, lament doesn't lead us to results. Lament leads us to trust. Lament doesn't lead to conclusion. It certainly could like it did for the blind man, but the point of lament isn't to to get to resolution. Lament leads us to grabbing hold of the hand of Jesus when we can't see what's in front of us, especially when we find ourselves beaten by the storms in life. Because the storms of this life will rage almost to the point where we cannot bear to go on. Storms will rage and we will not be able to see what's in front of us. Yet Jesus is reaching out his hand and in Jesus' hand we find the anchor in the storm. We find a place to lay down our burdens. We find a God who is bigger than the questions of why and how. And we find a God who we can trust to be our guide in the middle of the storm. Lament isn't meant to be an end. It's meant to have us trust in God when life is sunny or when the brokenness of life is bashing into our boat in the storm. Lament our prayers and pain that lead us to trust in who God is. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we we pray this morning, Jeremiah's lament in the book of Lamentation, chapter 3. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me all day long. He's filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He's broken my teeth with gravel. He trampled me in the dust. I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my afflictions and my wandering, the bitterness of the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this is what I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Jesus, you know our hearts. You know that we like to be in control and you know we don't like to wait. So I just ask that you use Jeremiah's word and lamentations to to seep into our souls. Allow the yet of your goodness to invade our lives so that we might see hope in the middle of hopelessness. That we are able to wake every morning, no matter what the storm is, to proclaim great is your faithfulness. Lord, I just ask that you bend our will to yours, even when we cannot see. Open our eyes to your will and your ways, so that we know that even in the midst of the storms of this life, we are not alone. Grant us words of lament to, to, to name our sorrows and our pain. And in the middle of our lament, keep reaching out for us, Lord, because it's in Jesus that we find an anchor in the storm. It's in Jesus we find a place to lay our burdens down. It's Jesus who's bigger than the questions of why and how. It's Jesus who we can trust in the middle of the storms to guide us through this life. Lord, we, we're just so in love with you, and we thank you so much for, for being able to come and lay all the things down in our lives to lament to you, to lament for others to you. God, we worship and praise you this day, and we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. So one of, uh, one of the anchors in, in my soul in the middle of the storms is found here at the table uh, where Jesus shows up in a very tangible way. The grace of God shows up in a very tangible way. It's for on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took bread broke it, blessed it, gave it to his friend saying, 
Friends, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, given thanks, blessed it, gave it to his friends, saying, Friends, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim my name to the ends of the earth.